You know, there were magical things and great, great lads to be around. Chance! Two two! What symmetry! What joy! What relief! And the memories I've got of that is probably one of my best moments in my career. We underestimated no one because we was that team. But he has a real presence. Oh! It's a super goal from Matt Elliott. When I came to Leicester and Martin and was a manager, I realised that playing football wasn't enough. It was about winning. Proud to leave Leicester out. Proud to walk behind Martin O'Neill. Guppy now with the corner. It's Elliott! And then back in front. The rest is history. Leicester City and League Cup success became synonymous with each other during the late 1990s as Martin O'Neill's side shrugged off the little old Leicester tag to become serial finalists in the competition. The Blue Army, whose side were now an established Premier League team, became accustomed to visiting the old Wembley Stadium, but Leicester City's record in Cup finals at the world-famous ground was unenviable. They did, however, boast a rich League Cup heritage, but with that success also came defeat. And that's where their road to glory in 2000 began, on the 21st of March, 1999, versus Tottenham Hotspur in the League Cup final at Wembley. Well, he's done a great job for the team, and that's exactly what John Robinson's telling them now. But they need 11 players out there, and he was let, the likelihood was that the club was going to boil over and he's going to get sent off. Ferdinand. Everson. Good turn of speed. It's Stefan Everson. Good save by Kellen Nielsen. On 92 minutes. I just, I just zoned out. I totally zoned out, and I, I just went into a sort of, I don't know, just a haze. And I'm thinking to myself, "Don't get upset. Don't get upset." And uh, anyway, the tears started rolling down because you think, you know, what it's like when you think to yourself, "Don't get upset," and then because you think you don't get upset, you do get upset. And then the tears started rolling down my eyes, and I sort of, I remember shaking hands. I think it was Ian Walker in goal. I just didn't want any. I didn't want to talk to anyone. I just wanted to stay out there for as long as possible and pretend that the nightmare hadn't happened. And then this arm went round my shoulder, and I thought, oh, for God's sake, who's it now? You know, just go away, just leave me alone. I don't need to talk to anyone. I don't want to talk to anyone. And then I got that Irish accent, and it was, uh, it was, don't worry, don't worry, we'll be back next year. And I, obviously, I realised it was Martin O'Neill, and I looked at him. I went, I went gaffer. I said, I'm 33 years of age. I said, we're not coming back next year. I said, this is this is a one-off. I said, we've blown it. You know, it's we're not it's not going to happen. We're not going to come back next year. He went, I promise you, we'll be back next year. It was a it was a cruel blow at the time, and uh, it was just a very strange game. Spurs went down to ten men because Justin Edinburgh gets sent off, and at that time you thought, well, Leicester have it in their grasp. And again, it was just too late. I remember Jerry Taggart saying the first thing he did was look up at the scoreboard. But unfortunately, we couldn't take advantage of the advantage, so to speak. And, uh, you know, and in the end, Tottenham deserveably won it, you know, with a, with a counter-attacking goal, which, you know, we just weren't able to, you know, you know, cut off. So it was very, very disappointing. There was a, not an arrogance, but there was an air of confidence, if you want, about whatever game they was going into or the lads were going into in the cup. Not only the cup, it was also in the league as well, but particularly in the cup, it felt like the lads felt we're not going to lose this game. You know, there was, like I say, it wasn't arrogance. It was just a, a confidence. Um, and then obviously, well, you know what happened in the final. It was a, 
a little, it was, well, it was disappointing because, you know, it was, it was a cruel way to, to actually lose a final. We should have won that Tottenham game. We, sh we should have had another, another you know, um, bit of history there. That should have been achieved and we messed it up. City began their 2000 League Cup campaign on the 14th of September 1999. The first of two legs against Crystal Palace came at Selhurst Park, where City had won 3-0 in the league and lost 3-0 in the FA Cup a season prior. It was no surprise then that the tie ended level at three goals apiece in the capital, albeit for two unlikely Leicester goal scorers, and they headed into the tie with Palace on the back of a 2-0 defeat at Sunderland. Yeah, we went down there. My, my instant memories are that I tried to claim a goal early on. I started the game and I put the ball across and someone knocked in deflection. It was a big deflection. So it would have been given as an own goal uh, these days, certainly. And then I disappeared out of the game. And from memory, I got injured. And then it all started to unfold a little bit. I can't remember the, the exact pattern, but I remember Theo Zagarakis going in goal. I was running out of goalkeepers that day. And uh, I still remember Theo with his goalkeeper shirt on. Looks about 10 sizes too big for him standing in goal. Martin O'Neill was going to put Tags in goal because he was the biggest lump there. Tags didn't want to go in goal, so he put Theo in. Martin O'Neill had actually asked me to go on that uh, originally, and I turned that down because I said, well, if I go on that, she'll have no one to head the ball out. Theo was just find, trying to find a way to get into the team somehow, really. But he, uh, he chucked a couple in and... We ended up nearly losing it, so our dreams could have been dashed at that early stage. It all been down to the, the little midfield Greek dynamo. It went to replay, but that's obviously something that doesn't happen these days. You know, it goes straight to penalties and I, but back then, I think in the early rounds, or at least one of the early rounds, it always went to a replay. So we were thankful about that. We got them back to Filbert Street and got the job done. So. You know, we were just happy to progress because, you know, it was a difficult two games against Crystal Palace, it has to be said. So we were just more than happy to get through that round. At half time, Martin O'Neill came in and he was fuming because nobody, but in particular Theo, was doing what they were meant to. And uh, Martin's screaming and shouting at Theo, saying, are you OK, Theo? And he's like, yes, boss. And he's like, are you sure now? Yes, boss. And he's scribbling on the, on the what, blackboard, as it was then. You know, well, why aren't you coming inside? He said, I'm looking for you to link up with Tony Cotley up front and filter down the right-hand side. He said, do you, you understand me? He's like, yes, boss. And he's like, well, why aren't you doing what I'm, what I'm asking you? He says, are you sure you understand me? He's like, yes, boss. He said, Theo, are you a an idiot? And he said, yes, boss. And he went, I knew it. You didn't know what, I haven't mean, got a clue what I'm talking about. The rest of the lads were in bits, obviously. Due to the broadcast of the UEFA Champions League fixtures six days later, there is no footage of City's second leg against Palace, but a packed Filbert Street witnessed a 4-2 triumph that sent their side into the third round. Next up for City were Grimsby Town, a second-tier side that two years earlier had knocked the holders City out with a 3-1 win at Blundell Park in round three. That was a source of determination for Martin O'Neill's side, and they made no mistakes this time around. We were the holders in 97 and we're going to Grimsby and I think they beat us 3-1, you know, and that was like a, you know, a real kick up the backside for us, you know, um, because we were a Premier League team and we were the holders and to go out to a, a lower league team such as that and they deserved to win it on the night as well. Cold, wet, I think it was, it was the, the, a typical cup tie where you can get turned over. Well, she got hurt. I think Julian Watts got a couple of broken ribs, etc., and it all just fell apart after being so successful and winning the year before in '97. But uh, yeah, it wasn't always um, glitz and glamour in, in the League Cup. I was awful. I played rubbish. And we come in after the game, and um, we was just wearing. I think we, for whatever reason, we was wearing like one to eleven because it was a cup game. I think it wasn't the squad numbers. So anyway, we come in after the game and Martin started. I think Casey Keller was in goal. You know, Casey, rubbish, how can you get in three goals? And number two, number three, and I'm wearing number 10. And when he got round to me, um, he looked at me, he went, Tony, he said, how much money did I pay for you? And I went, 500,000 boss. And he looked at me, he went, well, that was f 
making £500,000 too much. You know, we were defending champions. There's always, uh, there's always this thing about giant killers and we'd won it. So I, didn't th I don't think we, we possibly didn't show them as enough respect that they could actually beat us. Uh, and then obviously a bit of revenge this time. Uh, we showed them a lot more respect, especially at home. I just remember when, when Grimsby was pulled out of the hat that the build up to that game was all about making sure we didn't go out to Grimsby again. Uh, and that's probably why, you know, again, yet again, you see Martin put out, you know, a really strong team. That's a, that's a Premier League side there. I think at that point, you know, you're always thinking, listen, when you get past this one, then, um, you know, you're really into the nitty gritty then. So, uh, of course, we wanted to get one over them, but really we wanted to knock them over and, um, and make sure we were in the hat for the next round. And thankfully we managed to do that. You know, we, I think we beat them 2-0, Mozzie and Emil scored that night. Uh, and it was just about, you know, no semantics, no fancy stuff. We're here to do a job. We should win the game. We're the favourites. And that's exactly what we did. The big thing at that time was that they had this thing about being boring, boring Leicester. I think uh, Arsene Wenger had first sort of mentioned this. And instead of it being a sort of a, a badge of shame, both the players and the fans, I think, took it to be a, a sort of a badge of honour because although they were ostensibly boring, uh, they were also incredibly effective and that they were a well-respected side. Martin had built a team, uh, you know, and we, at times we weren't the prettiest, we weren't the easiest on the eye, but, you know, the dressing room was a strong dressing room. I believe in a successful team, you can have great players in that, but you've got to have great players with character, something different. It was a special bunch of lads. Um, I mean, I was fortunate throughout my whole career to play for clubs that had a good team spirit, which was probably the driving force behind uh, the team rather than flashy, super skilled, uh, brilliant ability players. It was more of a team, a team effort than individual effort. You know, you had to be technically good to play in the Premier League anyway, so he wasn't just uh, just throwing characters together. He would do his homework on how good a footballer you were first and foremost, but what was your characteristics that you brought with that as well. When you've got a, a dressing room full of characters like you did, or, or as I like to call them, mouthpieces, which I would include myself in as well, and to try and get to the end goal, and sometimes you have to let your feelings be known, and, and there was in plenty of occasion when you know, players will let their feelings be known towards me. With the commuting, it was it, it was it was difficult in a way for me because, um, you know, the boys would say go out on a night out on a Tuesday or something and have the day off on the Wednesday, so that when everyone came in on the Thursday morning, they're all talking about well what they did on the Tuesday night or what they'd done at horse racing the day before, whatever it might have been. So, so I, I I didn't really get involved in all that, but you know what I can say is they just made me feel really really welcome. When you're close off the pitch as well, it reflect, it, you can see it on the pitch. I think you have, there's a bond that you sort of, is created and um, it's just through going out and socialising, getting to know people more and, and getting to like people. Um, not many people like their work colleagues in, in any job, but we all got on really well. That team spirit took us everywhere, you know, we were built on that and um, and that man management with Martin went a long, long way. So when I look back, there were great times, great memories, but you wouldn't, um, you wouldn't work like that in this day and age. It just wouldn't happen. Leicester's key strengths at the time were considered to be the spirit and character within the squad. Giants of the English game, Leeds United, proved to be a formidable opponent for the Foxes. The Yorkshiremen were in the midst of a run of European campaigns. They'd also won 19 of their 25 games in all competitions, heading into the fourth round clash at Filbert Street, making Leicester's shootout success against David O'Leary's men even more impressive. The yeah, Leeds at Filbert Street, yeah, that was, a, that was a different sort of scenario, you have to say. Leeds, you know, obviously at that time, you know, an established Premier League team, difficult game. Uh, and it proved to be the case. Yeah, well, they were, you know, emerging as uh, a club that had been previously a sleeping giant. So we were fully aware of, of Leeds and the young players that they were, 
you know, um, interacting into the team. Um, but big names, big names in their in their team as well. So we we knew it was going to be a, a, a tough game and Leeds. There always seemed to be a little bit of a rivalry between Leicester and Leeds. I don't, I don't quite know why, but um, it always there was always quite a lot on the game and quite fiery. I think David O'Leary was the manager, I think, at that time. Him and Martin O'Neill were not best of friends. There used to be a bit of an edge in those games. It wasn't a it, it wasn't a night full of purists, that's for sure. Uh, I think you know the game obviously finished nil nil. Uh, not a lot of chances I can remember. Might have been one or two chances, but not a game, not a game that, that springs to mind as a, a Leicester City classic. I still think Leeds should go wider in the last third when they're making attacks. They're trying to get to... Oh, the big guy's been taken out. Does the ref deem him to have been taken out by... Intentionally, he does. And Radaby will have to go. He was cautioned in the first half will now be set off. Nigel Martin in goal, England goalkeeper, certainly one of the England keepers at the time. You think, right, this is going to be a tough, tough ask. I mean, Emil Eski was our out-and-out striker, centre-forward. You know, he was banging a few goals in. He's fancy Emil, even if he just levered it. You know, he'd take the goalkeeper in the back of the net as well as the ball. But um, Emil didn't get involved and, and big mate tags. All of a sudden, he went missing. Talks a good game, does Jerry, but... <laughs> Couldn't find him in, on that occasion. What goes through Jerry Taggart's round when it comes to penalties? Uh, get as far away from the penalty spot as possible, basically. <laughs> Not my forte, unfortunately, or fortunately. Difficult situations, penalties, but I thought, well, I'll give it a go. I was confident enough to give it a go. I'm, I'm not an expert by any means. You know, Muzzy, you fancied to tuck it away. Arnold Good Larkson, yeah. Sav was a decent penalty taker, in, in fairness. Normally, Sav would be first on the list. You know, he'd be, he'd be putting his hand up in the air to the manager. Yes, boss, yes, boss, I'll take one, I'll take one. And, and he'd even tell the, the manager which, in which order he'd want to go. For holding one's nerve and for heroes, Arno Goodlaugson steps up first step for Leicester City. And that's very coolly taken. It's Kelly now then for Leeds. He's missed. It clipped the top of the crossbar. Here's Matt Elliott now then for Leicester. Well, he was unlucky. Nigel Martin. One or two. Graham Fenton as well. They were all confident penalty takers. I just sort of supplemented it and went for broke a little bit. Made out as if I was going to place it, smash it down the middle, wait for the keeper to dive. It's back off the bar and it's not in. Lining up to take this kick. Is it against Martin? It's there! And Leicester through to the quarterfinals. Martin O'Neill begins the celebrations. It's been a long haul tonight, but finally they have come out on top. It, at that Pepsi kind of shooter. time, there was nobody better the, than Leicester City than, than getting through ties or just getting through games, getting the result we needed. Uh, and again, that was another really professional job that night. There were certain teams that we had their number, and I think Leeds were one of those as well. They were difficult games, they were quite attritional. You know, there was no love loss between the two teams, and, um, you know, to do them on penalties, you know, meant a lot. And it gave us that sort of incentive then to go on. Um, and, and the more closer you get to the final, the more excited you get, and the anticipation builds, and you start believing in what you're doing. City approached their fifth round clash with Fulham in a poor spell of form, failing to win any of their previous nine games. The tie on the 12th of January 2000 proved to be a memorable one, in which club icon Steve Walsh made amends for a mistake, Ian Marshall shone, Peggy Arfixad excelled, and Leicester displayed real courage to complete an incredible turnaround in what was an enthralling meeting with Paul Bracewell's side. When you score a goal, in the circumstances of what I did and the memories I've got of that, it's probably one of my best moments in my career. Yeah, that was an exciting game, Fulham. Uh, pretty eventful. <laughs> well, she certainly remembers it, that's for sure. 
Oh, it's a terrible ball, and Pesky Solino's in, and our Fexad was beaten. It's come to Horsfield. He'll never score a simpler goal. I made a, a huge error, um, but not a lot of people know that I was. I had a bad injury just uh, minutes before. Sorry, about 15, 20 minutes before that, and I tore my groin, and uh, I was out for quite a few games after that. But I couldn't play any more long balls because every time I kicked a long ball, it was just tearing my groin. So I just quickly looked up and uh, decided to take the option of just playing it easy to Jerry Tiger and Pesky Salido just, uh, you know, nipped in, through around the keeper and it was 2-0 and I was down on one knee and watched him score and I can tell you my heart was in my mouth and that was it as far as I was concerned. We were out of the cup and it was my fault. And it's a catastrophe for Steve Walsh who played it into Pesky Solido. Taggart did his best, but Horsfield had the whole goal to aim at. I remember there was a, a you know, real sort of lull in, in the atmosphere, and then there's a sort of realisation that, oh, what's going on here? This wasn't part of the plan. Um, it didn't look good for us, but uh, between Walshie and Ian Marshall, they managed to sort things out. Walsh is forward now. Chance here! 2 1! Marshall! The cup tie I never ever thought again. that you were out. I never thought I was ever out of a game till the final. You know, you, uh, if you're 4 0 down and there's a minute left, you, you, but at, at 85, there's still, and you, with that time added on, you think there's 10 minutes left, anything can happen. I just remember Marshy uh, heading the ball down, and I let the ball bounce just once, I think it was, and, and it just bounced up nicely, just so I, could, I was running onto it. I just. just kept my, high, my eyes on the ball and just hit it as hard as I could with my head down. Taggart, aimed at Marshall, chance, 2-2! Two -two! Steve Walsh, what symmetry, what joy, what relief! Boy, he feels better now! And it was a finish that, you know, anyone would have been proud with. It was, and smashed it and nearly ripped the net right in front of the fans is there's no better feeling i know that meant a lot to him because he hated you know letting the letting the lads down as the captain and he always wanted to leave from the front so for him to score at the other end yeah it, you know it's part of what steve was about it took us into extra time and we thought right here we go this is a bit more like it we're going to finish him off in the injury time and then chris coleman scored morgan another target In front! The subtlest of touches! I remember that being predominantly down to me. Certainly he beat me in the air, which I wasn't happy about because you know, Chris is a very good defender, but I fancy my chances airily against him. I was a bit loose and sort of came out of the blue. 3 2 down again. Oh no, surely not. We always stuck in with games and, and, and you know, just try to, to, the, to the death and the final whistle would always you know, give 100% to get a goal, and especially when we had quite a big side. All it would take for is uh, someone to give away a silly free kick in a, in a poor area. Oh, it's come through to Elliot turning. And Marshall! Yes! And I remember I just set up a business with a good friend of mine, and. Um, he said to me, it's on the telly tonight. I said, yeah. He said, let's make a T-shirt and um, if you score, pull it over your head and, and, and run with it. I said, no, I'm not doing that. He said, no, come on, it'd be great for the business. And I, so I, I said, yeah, but with really no intentions of doing it. And I don't, th I, don't, I don't think I did it on the first goal. I can't remember, but I know when I scored the second goal, I remember running away with uh, my top over my head. And I remember Martin O'Neill, like we got through, and again, typical Martin, the first thing he came and said to me was, I don't do that again, son, you know, having this top on and, and all that. And I'm like, all right, you know, it's like, it don't matter, does it, Martin? It don't really matter, but you're still having a go at me, you know. Of their five penalty takers against Leeds in round four, Leicester have only two available tonight. But as he did then, he will now. Arne Gunnlaugsson with the first kick for Martin O'Neill's side. 
standing on the halfway line, you're just hoping and praying that you score your penalties and, and you know, the keeper at least saves one of them, if not two, or they stick one over the bar or they hit the post or, you know, com you know com completely fluff their lines. As he did then, he does now. Scores. Four years since Fulham were in a penalty shootout. Chris Coleman. That's how it feels to miss. Robbie Savage, the very epitome of Leicester industry. The epitome of precision. 2 0 Leicester. Paul Trollope. He went the same way as his skipper. Graham Fenton. His first clean kick at the ball. And it was clean enough. 3-0. You don't want to be the one that misses and, you know, you feel for people that are going to miss. But you try and get a little bit of a sense of the body language of players. You know, you can kind of tell whether people are confident or not. Jeff Horsfield must score for Paul Bracewell or Fulham's dream is over. Horsfield! Affects that saves and Leicester City are through. Three penalties to nil. And poor Jeff Horsfield can only walk away disconsolately while Leicester move to within one two legged tie of a third League Cup final in four years. I actually didn't have to take one. I think because from memory, again, I think Fulham might have missed all three. I certainly remember Jeff Horsfield missing, um, which Robbie Savage was very quick to point out. They were having a f running feud as the game was going on. Jeff Horsfield had come from a building site, non-league football, into professional football, and it was quite well documented, and Sav being Sav was quick to remind him of the of the fact and kept offering him a bit of work in the summer who'd come and do his patio for him if, uh, if he behaves himself. And Horsfield was fuming, he was, he was dying to get hold of Sav uh, through most of the game and uh, we were willing to help him actually after. <laughs> but so uh, we thought we'd wait until the game's over. But when Horsfield went to take the penalty, Sav was giving him a bit as he runs up and he misses and Sav was laughing and joking. And then Horsfield's eyes met Sav's and Sav realised <laughs> the extent of what his mickey taking could have produced and uh, Orsfield come tearing at him. Sav was off, got, got a few of the lads in between him and uh, never quite succumbed to Jeff Horsfield. Although quite funny, not, about six months later, I think Sav ended up signing for Birmingham and um, Horsfield was there. So I would have liked to have been a fly on the wall when that conversation occurred. After navigating a tricky match against Fulham, an injury ravaged Leicester City without the likes of Neil Lennon and the experienced striker Tony Cotty, headed to the West Midlands to take on John Gregory's Aston Villa in the first of two legs in the 2000 League Cup semi-final. Martin O'Neill's misfits came away from the iconic stadium without conceding a goal and determined to succeed in the second leg at Filbert Street. Villa game, it feels very special to all of us. I think we're, you know, on the odd occasion we do talk about, you know, we get together and you talk about games you tend to not to, to be honest. Um, but the Villa game especially, um, going down to uh, Villa Park the first leg, we did, we were up against it. We were underdogs. Um, they, were, they were the big side in the Midlands at that time. Uh, I'd played against them from a youth level and always getting beat. Merson made himself available. Taylor's in there! Oh! You're talking about a good Aston Villa team. Uh, and so that was a difficult, difficult place to go. You know, even, even with a full, full strength Leicester said he said, that would have been a difficult place to go and try and get a result. I mean, I remember that some of the fans was, um, in no uncertain terms, was basically, don't lose this one, not to that lot. If you, if you, you know what I mean? If we're going to lose, we don't lose to them. Villa throwing a lot forward in the home leg of the semi-final. Walker across goal! Oh, what a save! Maybe a second chance for Taylor. It's a fine stop by Tim Flowers. It's probably one of the worst games I've ever played in, basically, as regards to shots on goal for us. I know we were missing some big players, some key players were out missing that night. We had a lot of players out injured. 
I remember that. Um, and it was another one of sort of the way Martin would approach that would be, listen, we'll just patch ourselves up. We'll get through it. We'll find a way. We'll stay in the tie. Um, we'll get them back to Filbert Street and, and, and we'll win it there. There are one or two who aren't on full power, that's for certain. But the game is over. It's been another brave, really fierce, firm Leicester rear guard action in a cup tie. They have achieved their minimum requirement and they've got away from Villa Park all square. Their supporters are thrilled by that. Those of Aston Villa might be disenchanted that uh, their team couldn't break through, that they couldn't was largely down to one fantastic save from Tim Flowers. We went there, we did a job and came away goalless. There were complaints about us from manager John Gregory of Aston Villa that we didn't get over the halfway line. Again, pretty harsh in my view. We hadn't conceded a goal, so you know we went into the second leg and I think we was confident, you know, again, Villa had some good players, but, you know, we, we felt in, at home in the second leg. Um, I think that's the one thing you, you, you like to have when it's a two-legged affair, you want to try and have the second leg at home. You go back to Field Street and you know you've got a chance, you know, you go back there and win, you, you threw into the, into the final at Wembley again. So we was like, that was a, the carrot that was dangled and we knew over two legs we, we, we could get through. I love playing at Filbert Street. It was, um, you know, it was a ground I'd always, in, always enjoyed playing there as, um, as a West Ham and Everton player as well. You get um, fond memories and and uh, a relationship with the ground and the people attached to it. You know, the the surroundings, the Bentley's roof with everyone standing while you're playing. I can remember still every time just looking up at them Bentley roof uh, people who obviously had not paid to get in and just thought. <laughs> About 20 of them all stood on a roof. I, I just thought it was always a great atmosphere there. You know, I always thought the, the fans were good as well. They always got behind the team, particularly the boys behind the goal. And you know, you, you almost felt at times they could be like a 12th man for the for the team. You know, there was obviously plenty of occasions where we were struggling as a team and trying to get back in games. And you know, they just the noise level went up and they were almost sucking the ball into the goal at times. I don't know how everybody else could feel about it but I you know when the when the fans were behind us you know you, you grew a few inches taller you ran a bit faster you ran a bit longer you got your foot in a bit you know that was that sort of thing it was special even just walking out on the pitch for me was quite you know um, emotional and uh, you, you warm up and things like this and um, when I crossed that white line that was it you just fought, fought as hard as you could. Villa didn't like coming to Filbert Street well, nobody liked coming to Filbert Street to play Leicester City. They probably would have been favourites going into the day, and um, but you know, over the piece, you know, whether it be Premier League or in the Cup, we had a really good record against Villa. I don't remember them sort of beating us at all, and in the four years under Martin. So we went into that second game confident that if it was a battle, we had the players that would get us over the line, and obviously, you know, very physical side, Matty playing up front as well. You know, we, we obviously, when Matty did play up front, we went a little bit more direct, but people underestimated, you know, his actual technical ability. John Gregory mentioned that we sort of just sat there and made it difficult for him and didn't really try to attack in the first leg. I think some people would have, maybe Marino would have called that a masterclass, I don't know, but, you know, times have changed, I guess. Um, yeah, so when you, you hear things like that in the press, it's just your team talk, isn't it? There's certain memories in your career where you remember, you can see it in your mind's eye, I can see it now, where, where the cross came in and, um, and then Matty Elliott's there, he's given one little movement to fool the defender and then come across him. Well, I remember the ball coming across and seeing Matty and I think he's not going to, he'll have to just try and bring it down or something like that. He's, he's falling away from the, from the goal with big Ugo Hethiog on him, and he got enough to head it back past uh, David James, who was an England, England goalkeeper at the time as well. Is it has now arrived at the centre, Savage. Now it's Muzzy, is it? Savage again. Only Elliott in the box for Leicester, but he has a real presence. Oh! It's a super goal from Matt Elliott. In first half stoppage time. It was one of those, you know, as soon as it leaves your, your forehead, I knew it was going back. Oh, David James is a giant, he's six foot five, you know, long limbed, athletic, agile, 
still nowhere near it. Unlucky David, that was a nice sight to see and nice little celebration where my momentum just sort of carried me. A big smile on my face and be, getting jumped on by all the lads. Even though it was early in the game, relatively, no, before half time, you know, we took that lead and it almost felt as if we weren't going to relinquish it. The funny thing was, I don't know if it was me and Muzzy would, would come off at the time. And I was up the tunnel and I couldn't watch the last couple of minutes. And then when the final whistle blew, we were just sprinting out onto the pitch celebrating with everyone. Um, and the crowd were going absolutely ballistic. But it was just a, a great feeling to know that you were going back down to the cup final. Eating away the seconds now. Nakarakis going down under the weight of the challenge from Henry. It's hard for defenders, it's hard for the defending side, they're anxious. They can't really get at the ball here without giving it a free kick away. There can't be too much time now left on Paul Durkett's watch. We've played three minutes of stoppage time and it's Wembley again for Leicester City as Martin O'Neill celebrates with John Robertson. The old Nottingham Forest allies have done it again for the third time in four seasons. Martin O'Neill's team, thanks to the goal from Matt Elliott, have reached the League Cup final. An outstanding achievement and surely the perfect reply to those who chastise them for their dogged, determined approach. Some say negative. Well, this is their answer. I, I think it was Big Ron said something along the lines of square pegs, round holes, and I think that spurred Matty on a little bit. It was midweek sports special, I remember. I got home on the Wednesday night, watched the game, brief highlights, not a lot to report. Ron Atkins said, oh, Leicester City, extremely lucky to still be in this tie. They've come here with no ambition. Talk about square pegs in round holes. They've even got Matt Elliott playing up front. So I heard that and I thought, oh, you know, it's true, Ron, but slightly harsh. But OK, yeah, we'll take it on the chin and see, see how things go. Then the second leg, obviously, I scored the winner. We were celebrating, lap of on around the pitch with all the fans. Everybody was looking forward to a trip to Wembley. I'm going to run down the tunnel, think, go and enjoy the atmosphere in the changing rooms. Who do I see on the right hand side having an interview with Gary Newborn, who was the presenter of the midweek sports special? Ron Atkinson, live on telly. Obviously, not feeling too good about Villa going out. I had a little trot down the tunnel, I thought, shall I? A little rewind, it just popped up, popped my head around. Hi, oh, Ron, square pegs, round holes. See you at Wembley, mate, yeah? There was only one person in charge. As big as the characters were and as big as they were physically and mentally, Martin O'Neill was in charge of that dressing room and everybody knew that. But, you know, he wasn't in charge in a way that, he, you know, he threw his weight about. You know, he was... Half the time he wouldn't speak, speak to <laughs> during the week, you know, and uh, it, was, it was mainly in the dressing room where he came to the fore. You know, the Gaffer's team talks were always inspirational for all of us. I mean, I think any player that, that played under him, you know, listen, you know, you've got a squad of 30 players, you know, you can't keep everyone happy all the time. So there'll be times when players won't be, you know, would, would maybe weren't keen on the manager, blah, 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 because it's all about playing, of course it is. But I'd be surprised if anyone said that he couldn't, you know, those team talks he gave before the game, half time, were amazing, you know, amazing. And, and I was really fortunate that I played most of my career under him, you know, right from the non-league. I remember when I was in Wickham Wanderers in the Vauxhall Conference going nowhere and he turned up and a group of young players, he put such belief in all of us and we went on a journey and, and the journey for me took me to Leicester, you know, and, you know, so absolutely amazing. And, and it was, it just had this, he had this knack that when he gave you praise, you felt praised. Matt Elliott once told me that, um, you know, Marty O'Neill was one of the few managers that when he, he, he could walk into the into the players room, say down at the uh, at the training ground where it was noisy, the moment he stepped in, it, everything went silent um, when, when they saw him. And um, he, he, he held that sort of um, uh, awe, if you like, from the players. Uh, and and if, they, they, if he just sat down, then the noise started up again. But they all went quiet in case he wanted to say something. Now, whether that was out of fear or respect, to this day, I don't know. I think it was a combination of the two things. Martin had that. But also, Martin, I'd be down there, you know, and it'd be 11 o'clock and the lads have been out for an hour, and Martin would be making himself a cup of tea. 
it wasn't really out there all the time. You know what I'm saying? He mixed it. He didn't want to be in the faces as well. I think sometimes he made a point of doing it because he knew that we was all waiting to start training and you, you couldn't start training without the manager. So he would just keep you waiting and then all the lads are getting agitated. You know, come on, you know, you said it 11 o'clock start and it's half 11 sort of thing. But I think he'd done it. You know, he played the mind games with the players and um, there, there's no doubt he was the boss, without a doubt, 100%. And, you know, even though the really powerful characters, you know, at times would speak up and say things, Lenny, Marshy, etc., Walshy, you know, we all knew who the manager was, we all knew who the boss was, and although you gave your opinion and you challenged him, there was only ever one winner. You can argue as much as you want. Part of his character be reflected on the team. Yeah, Martin was, you know, very emotional. If he won, it was like, you're on top of the world, it's like winning the World Cup. If you lost, it was doomsday. Uh, he would hardly even look at you, never mind speak to you. But that wasn't anything to be taken personally, it was just the way it was. You know, just so much emphasis on winning games, however that was. Didn't have to play pretty, didn't have to be the better team. You know, just give your all, be committed, and if you come up on top, then it was, you know, it was a wonderful experience. Yeah, if you lost, it was dejection, um, bordering on devastation, <laughs> and it made you more determined to correct things next time around. I remember him coming in and taking me to one side and saying, lad, you're going to play. I want you to play. All I want you to do is just enjoy yourself. Go out there and enjoy playing football. Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, OK, cool. Um, you can say that, but allowing someone to actually go and do that is a t totally different thing. But he did. He didn't fill my head with a load of information. He would tell me, uh, I need you to do this. Get the ball, turn and run. OK, that's what I did. And that was my, that was my game. Uh, I remember one time um, I got the ball into me, controlled it laid it back to Robbie Savage. Robbie Savage, I think he took a touch and gave it, and then someone nicked the ball off him. And, and I thought, oh. he came in and had got me. I thought, well, what's he having got me for? And he goes, what's he going to do with the ball? I goes, I don't know, he's going to control it. Pass it. No, you get the ball, you turn, you run. He can't do nothing. <laughs> I didn't think we got on. Speaking to him after, like we get on quite well now, but speaking to him after, it was because his demands of what he wanted from me was more than what was that he thought that I was giving. He was a genius, you know, we could get the best out of you. He was um, passionate, he'd make you run through brick walls for him. He could also make you feel that big. Um, didn't bother much for the tactical side of the game, you know, we trusted his instincts and, um, for example, when we got promoted, you know, all the way through pre-season, we were playing my back four. He, two days before the season started, he bought Casey Keller and Spencer Pryor. Played at Rooka Park on the Saturday and we were 3-5-2. You haven't worked on it. He just said, look, I trust you. This is the shape. Go out and do it. We played like that for the four or five years that he was there with you know, great success. But in terms of his personality, very, really intelligent guy, you know, and a winner. He got the best out of you. And that's what good managers do. He must have done it in his Nottingham Forest days, uh, under Clough and stuff. Because um, he always, he'd love to do it. You know, take you away, forget about football for a bit. Um, go and enjoy yourself for two or three days and it was like you didn't have to sort of tell us twice sort of thing. No, well we all used to love a trip and, and, and Martin used to love it. Well he didn't like travelling with us but he used to like letting us go on a trip and um, and he knew what it what it was. It was a let your hair down for a few days and um, enjoy yourself. Don't get into trouble. Well the manga was the was a typical loss was a disaster. Some of the players went and played golf. Some of the players decided that they were going to have a few bar games or bar quizzes. Well, we had a lot to drink. Uh, and the worst thing I think we'd done was go back to the piano bar. That was the worst thing. We should have just all gone to bed. And I remember Gary Lineker was in the bar at the time. He was stood at the bar. And as I walked in, he's gone <laughs> like this. So I, I thought, what's, what's going on here? Anyway, they were loud in the bar, in this piano bar um, area. And um, he, Lineker, I went over to him, oh, Gary, you know, he's, oh God, these are, these are bang on it. During which point, John Robertson had come over um, where we'd had a couple of beers, it was a little bit lively and we got talking. Where, where's the gaffer? Because he hadn't flown out on the plane with us and Robbo went, oh, he's flying out in the morning. And uh, so Marshy went, oh, give us your phone, Robbo. And he borrowed John Robertson's mobile. So I'm sitting there and I'm, ringing, goes to answer phone and I, 
Oh, I gaff them all, she hear you. We're having a great time. Is there any chance of the lads having a bit of a later curfew? I said, anyway, if you get this message, give us a bell back. I'll see you tomorrow. Put the phone down, gave it back to Robbo. Forgotten. Obviously, he never rang back. Marshy, what are you doing? It was funny. It was really, really funny. Robbo was laughing. Me and Tim were laughing. Marshy thought it was hilarious. Um, but it was obviously was a, a phone call that was going to come back to haunt Marshy. Let's put it that way. We bumped into Gary Lineker and I think Gary had one look at us and had a beer and decided to leave. We obviously decided to take on the piano and clunk away at the piano. And then uh, for some reason, the fire extinguisher got sent. Stan decided that he took a little bit of a fancy to a fire extinguisher. And Stan had already been warned once not to let the fire extinguisher off. Uh, but Stan being Stan, you know, he took matters into his own hands and decided to... I don't think he read the label. It was like dust, but it just seemed to engulf the whole... <laughs> it, it, it looked like he only done it for like three or four seconds, but in them three or four seconds, it just managed to complete... I just remember people where it just had white faces and like you see their eyeballs and stuff like that. It was mental. And then after that, we sort of filtered off and went to bed. I guess sometimes on nights out, we were near the knuckle. Although we didn't do anything to upset anyone or, or rude to anyone, but you know, groups of lads just enjoying themselves, letting their hair down. I think in hindsight, everyone had worked so hard to get to the final. You know, that was our way of letting off steam. I mean, Stan was cup tied, so I can't use that as, a, as an excuse for him. But yeah, you know, listen, Stan, we all love Stan. He was uh, he was brilliant for us. Um, I just wish the fire extinguisher had been water, like he thought it was, instead of powder. We might have ended up. This, I might have ended up playing 18 holes of golf. The next morning, I get a phone call from John Robertson, and he called me Paddy. He says, Paddy, come on, get up. I says, what, what time are you training that? You know, no, no, get up. Got to pack our bags and go. And Martin had been on the phone to John and said, John, I'm, I'm flying out this afternoon. He said, don't bother, we've been sent home. And you can imagine the reaction from Martin. So I was due to fly over with Martin the day after the lads had gone. Met him at the training ground at Beaver Drive and, uh, you know, he's in a quite sort of thoughtful mood, um, you know, quite serious mood, seemed to be, not for any particular reason. And he just said, Maddie, put your suitcase in the boot, sit in the back of the car, I'll be with you in a minute. Literally that second, the phone goes. About an hour and a half later, I'm still in the car. And his face like thunder. And he's prowling around the, the, uh, the car park at the training ground. And I'm thinking to myself, this is not good. Something's amiss. And his face is getting darker and darker and more scrumpled as, uh, as time ticked by. And then it, 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 I can hear him effing and blinding at people and whoever it is down the phone. And then he comes back. I opened the door and said, everything okay, Gaffer? He went, not at all, man. He, he said, uh, put it this way, you need to take your suitcase out of the boot. We're not going to La Manga. I was like, all right, okay. Well, what's, what's happening? He said, I'll let you know. The bus was on the runway where the plane was to pick us up. So the cameras were all trying to get pictures. They got one of Muzzy with his middle finger up um, at the window. I think it was, it, was, it might have been Jerry Taggart, but uh, it was Muzzy. Jerry Taggart got this, the, because it was in front of Jerry, he got in trouble for that. So the hotel on the M69, Sketch League range, we're going there, Gaffer wants to see us all. all right, so I'm thinking to myself, I'm cracking up at this stage, because as I said, I've not done anything wrong, and I know that we have got the biggest in our life coming our way. So we go to the hotel at Sketchley Grange, everyone goes into this private room. When he came in, he left, he, as usual, he'd leave you waiting for an hour. So you sat there, you know, then he'd just come through, he tore his jacket off, threw it on the floor and went mental. Stan Collymore, Marshy, me, slaughtered two weeks wages again for me. Um, it, was, it was not very nice, I can tell you. Martin's tearing strips off every player anyway, and at the end of it he went, oh, there's one more thing. Marshy, never phone my phone again. He said, you're not a good enough player to call my phone. <laughs> and I just killed him like that. Marshy's head just dropped down. Yes, Gaffer, yes, Gaffer. <laughs> Big brave Marshy, sobered up. And then I got fined two weeks wages and Stan got fined two weeks wages and I'd, all that I'd done was phoned him 
on the, th you know, and all this national press that he brought onto Leicester, and I just made a phone call to him. I think it was then, look, you know, this is this is out of order. Obviously, this is wrong, but we are now full steam ahead for this final. So nothing more than complete professionalism is. Um, so I think he turned it round, and we left that room, obviously knowing that we'd all been given a you know, sound telling off, but at the same time, everyone was tuned in from that moment on for the final. City approached the last ever League Cup final to be held at the old Wembley Stadium, with just two wins from their previous 18 games across all competitions. In London, they met a Tranmere Rovers side containing the tournament's highest scorer, former Fox David Kelly, having swept aside Bolton Wanderers 4-0 over two legs in the semi-final. Martin O'Neill's Foxes, frequently the underdogs, a title which they so often thrived off, were suddenly billed as favourites and were seeking to eradicate the pain of their heartbreaking defeat to Tottenham a year earlier. They had never won a cup final at Wembley Stadium, but thanks to their stopgap striker, they were thrilled to finally set the record straight. We used to stay at Burnham Beaches, which is where England used to stay on their training camp prior to big games and uh, Martin used to like developing that sense of you know a big game atmosphere I mean we'd go to the theatre the n two nights before in, in London's West End I think it was that year we went to Saturday Night Fever which was quite funny because um, all the lads were going most of them don't want to get involved in the theatre I was quite happy to I've been a few times myself quite enjoy it but a bit of grumbling and moaning, like, what are we doing going to the theatre? I don't know old Tosh this is. But before you knew it, Saturday Night Fever, the Bee Gees, you look round over your shoulder, there's 30 lads up, giving it all the old finger pointing and everything, the old John Travolta bits. It was the seventh trip to Wembley, I can remember, in, in nine seasons, which it was, that was incredible in itself. And, um, you know, people were... We almost got blase about it. It was like a, an annual trip out. Um, and I remember somebody saying, well, it's about time they started paying rent, you know, at Wembley, because they were there that often. It was the last League Cup final at Wembley, the last final, uh, League Cup final at Wembley. And the old Wembley Stadium, although it had a good atmosphere, did leave a lot to be desired, and there weren't the best sight lines. But the, uh, so it wasn't the best of stadium. But, but in terms of the atmosphere, it was great because the Leicester fans took over one half of the stadium or that end of the stadium. Um, you know, loads of flags and balloons and it was, you know, all the, the, the build up to walking up Wembley Way and all of that, it was, it was superb. Just coming to the stadium, you know, as it was here is, what a sight, when you come driving over in the coach, come over the top of the hill, certainly, you know, you used to be able to, you could see the Twin Towers. You saw that and that was the stuff of dreams because, We'd experienced it before, the majority of us, at one level or another, but whenever it occurred, it still got you. So I stopped at the Holiday Inn that night and I got up, put my gear on, I went to Wembley Way, of course, all of the Blue Army was coming in and they're all looking at me thinking, what's Birch doing? Stood there, bottom of Wembley Way. And as our team coach came round, it stopped, doors open, I got on, front seat, going up Wembley Way, gates open, in to the dressing room and uh, that's just come to me this is the first time i've thought about that practically since that day and they were the occasions that uh, that, that i loved at, at wembley you know it's hard to describe the, you know what it engulfs you as a human being you know the build up to the final uh when your bus pulls up at wembley where and you've got that long straight road with wembley in the background it's a big occasion, you want to play well, you've got a lot of friends and family coming to the game, millions of people watching it, so there is pressure. Um, even though it was only Tranmere, and no disrespect to them, um, we, what was good about our team was we underestimated no one because we was that team. We was the team that was always underestimated. So we, we weren't going to, you know, there was going to be no slip-ups. remember coming out, having a little walk around the pitch before, survey the situation, get a feel for the, for the stadium, etc. just acclimatise. But then coming out before the game, I remember all the fanfare, all the, the pyrotechnics going off and everything. It was a real 
glitzy occasion, a bit too much, a bit over the top really, but proud to lead Leicester out. The main aim for me was to, to play in that final against Tranmere and you know, above all else, win the game. And I didn't care how we won it. I didn't care whether it was the worst game in history and we won it 1-0. I really didn't care. For me, it was after the previous year and all my other experiences, just win the game. It may not be everyone's idea of a dream final, but try telling that to the fans, players and officials of two clubs determined to milk every precious moment. Leicester, hardly strangers into Wembley, but cast this year in the unusual role of favourites at Tranmere Rovers, for whom six months ago the very idea of being one step from Europe would have been thrown out by Royal the Rovers for being too far-fetched. Magical, you know, and if you can't look forward to them games, then you're struggling. Um, and, and I said, like, when you walk out of the dressing room and you walk up the little incline out of the tunnel, um, and then the crowd see you, I think those sort of things you, you dream about as a kid. I know it sounds a little bit corny, but you do, you know, you think, what must it be like? I think it was one of the few moments in life, it was every bit as good as you hoped it would be. Well, the mindset was, you know. We're probably the favourites because we're the Premier League team, but this is, you know, a dangerous team to play against. But we felt we had the quality. We believe we had the quality, and you know, we had the the memories of the season before, you know, and how that had got away from us, and how that probably we hadn't played as well as anywhere near as well as we could have done against Tottenham, and lost it in the manner in which we did. And I think, you know, no matter who we'd have played that day, we'd have won. Things were to eventually go beyond my wildest dreams um, you know, to go so well. I knew what was expected of me. I knew areas that I had to try and hit, but the insurance policy that the manager gave me was that he'd make sure someone was near post, front man. So in my attempt to try and, try and hit it as hard as I could and get the whip on it, if I got it wrong and it was too low, we'd have someone there. There was my insurance that way. Secondly, we had someone go right, arc right round the far post. So if I overcooked it, um, and leant back or whatever and, and it, you know, and overhit it, you'd have someone there to give me that insurance. So that gave me the, the confidence to, to go for it, you know? Um, you know. So that's my part of it. Obviously, the boys in the middle, you know, um, they've got to want it more than the opposition. And, um, you know, I think May Elliott showed that day that he wanted it more than the guy who was marking him. Elliott will be a target in the centre, along with Jerry Taggart. Eski is on the near post. Here's Elliot, the crossbar, and in. Matt Elliot strikes for Leicester City. Murphy, Leicester, left his thought. I was just gutted because his, his first header, when it hit the bar and bounced down, and all I wanted was a tap in from like a yard out. You know, I was hovering, and I was just waiting for the ball to just when it hits the bar, don't hit the bar and go into the net hit the bar and come out and then I would have headed in from half a yard out and I would have got the goal in the final. But Elliot was being greedy, you know, he, he put the ball in the, the net, it was great. Man. Lennon takes over again and finds Heskey. Chance here for Heskey now, the referee's got to make a decision here. Oh, He's oh. off. Clint Hill joins a small, sad list of players to be dismissed in a Wembley Cup final. And when you think he got away with that challenge in the first half on Emil Heskey, he just sailed too close as soon to as the they win. got a player sent off, in my own personal mind, which I imagine would have filtered through the team was, job done before it was over. Um, you know, 1-0 up, they've got a defender sent off. And we probably, you know, subconsciously um, just switched off. Just switched off. And obviously when you get a man sent off, you see it in football, you know, week in, week out. Um, Teams galvanise themselves because they haven't got that extra player. Everybody does that little bit extra bit of work. Okay, a little lightweight up front. I think a cutting edge trap here. Can they find one here? Looks like right by Jones. It's Kelly! Oh, there's the answer. David Kelly! It was a venomous strike. Brilliant headed out by Jones. And what a finish by that man, Kelly again. That happens sometimes when players get sent off the other team over 10, 15 minutes, they sort of rally together. Um, but once we sort of got our composure back, um, I just thought there was going to be one winner. I had a little routine um, going into that, that, that corner. 
And really, I was just thinking, right, OK, get the ball down, get my steps right. You know, I can't remember, it was about five steps, something like that. So there was a routine that I'd practised over a number of years that sort of came together for that moment, it felt like, you know. And so if I'd have hit the first man, I'd never forgive myself, you know. And, and I, so I just want make sure you get a good connection here, get the whip, trust the whip, trust the technique, keep your head down. Um, and then get it, give the boys in the middle every chance to do what they do, you know. And, um, you know, that was my part. It's the hardest thing in the game to score a goal. So, you know, Matty Elliott's story is, is the far more important one, of course. Thanks to David Kelly, the man who thought his career was over with his rickety knees. Now he has responded this season to the call of Chatmere Rovers. Guppy now with the corner. It's Elliott! It's joy is short-lived, and it's Elliot again. And the it's keeper a, stayed on his line. It's a carbon copy. Watch how he... I've said Chelling has played decent, but on two occasions, from set plays, he's let that man get away from him. He's done it exactly again, you know. But luckily, Steve, Steve Gutby came up with the goods with a pinpoint cross, and I got on the end of it. So we weren't on level terms. We didn't let Tranmere settle on that, that equaliser, really. And... Got ourselves back in front pretty quickly. They had a player called David Challoner, who was a long throw expert, and uh, he was supposed to be crucial to the outcome. And indeed he was, because he was the one that failed to pick up Matt Elliott twice for his two goals. So yes, Challoner was important, but not in the way people thought. I remember screaming at the cat, a ball came into the box and Scott Taylor had had a header at the back post, he'd lost me at the back post. Towers took it well. And I just remember screaming at the cat, at Tim Flowers. And I can't remember, I went, save a cat! And he pulls it out. The ball's going in the top corner, but the cat, Plucks it out of the air, and as, he's, as he comes down and you know, collects the ball, he just winks at me and goes, never in any doubt, big man. And I think that was a moment. That was later on in the game, but that was a realisation. That was a moment where I thought, we're going to win this. Esky up front here with Marshall. That was Chaloner. Time rapidly running out now for Trapmere. Can they raise themselves for yet one more time? A long, long ball from Murphy. Well, that's it! It's another glorious moment for Leicester City. League Cup winners for the second time in four years. And and the I first just remember seeing Lenny and well Burnham, me and Lenny were childhood friends growing up in Northern Ireland, so the natural thing to do was to go straight to him and grab him. And as we're grabbing, we're embracing and you know, I'm shouting in his ear, Lenny, we've done it. And he's shouting in my ear, Tags, we've done it. And I'm shouting, Lenny, we've done it. You know, Tags, he grew up with. So that was a special moment to win a cup final with Tags because we played in the same boys team and we knew each other all our lives, really. We're on the floor, the pair of us rolling around like two lovers shouting, we've done it, we've done it. I can't believe it. I think as a team, we was just, we were just all so pleased because we'd, we'd righted the wrong of the previous year and that was really, really important. When the final whistle goes, you think, right, brilliant, going up them stairs, get the, get the trophy. Worked hard for this, uh, a lot of sacrifice been made uh, and we'll probably have a good night. I just wanted the winner's medal around my neck. That's what I wanted and, you know, where I'd zoned out the year before in self pity you know, this year this particular year it was it was all about looking forward to going up the steps and that it's a long climb but Matt Elliott the two goal hero and his teammates are walking on air so often there has always been stretched to the very limit this season but now they have their reward for their remarkable spirit their resilience and their undoubted ability make no mistake about that they are the first League Cup winners of the new century, the last in this famous old stadium in its current form. As the Martin O'Neill success story continues to gather pace. Brian Clough there joining in his celebration. Little, little giggles of disbelief to myself and 
You know, my dad also, you know, I saw him after the game and he, he was the same, he was just shaking his head. Saying, I, I can't believe this, I can't believe this. I'm like, what, Dad? He said, well, where's all this come from? I, was, I don't really know myself, Dad, but let's enjoy it, eh? And it was one of them, and then simply going up the steps and you're just there and you, you see, I remember seeing John Elson, the then chairman who was there, and he gives you a big, you know, congratulatory hug, etc. cetera. Uh, it's just nice to see you know, everyone's happy faces sense of achievement. Um, also, one of my thoughts was, how long is it going to be before Neil Lennon grabs this trophy off me? So, <laughs> and it wasn't long, mind you, you could see it as soon as I put it up in the air, you could see Neil looking at it, I've got photos at home. He's looking at it, put his arm up, grabbing. I'm like, okay, okay, Lenny, all right. Just give me a moment, will ya? Youngest son was due to be born that day. Um, his mum was thinking I was going to go to the hospital if he was born that day, right, and missed the final. It was never going to happen. <laughs> I went along with it up to a point. I said, don't worry, I'll sort Martin out if there's a problem, but there's no way I was missing this final. Um, thankfully, he waited three days so we could enjoy the celebrations uh, of, of winning the cup and all that went with that. So we had a few days having a good time. Three days later, youngest son's born, had another few days having a good time. That was a long old week, as you can imagine. And what, on top of that, again, uh, my father, who was you know, an inspiration to me, um, as is the case with a lot of sons and fathers. You know, I absolutely loved him to bits. Um, he, he's no longer with us anymore, and he, uh, he backed me first and last goal scorer. He liked a little flutter here and there. £20 on each, came together, doubled up, and a 600 quid. That was in his back pocket as well, as well as a little medal and a Man of the Match trophy and, and the Wormington Cup to boot. It was uh, just a special day, really. Everything, after that, everything was downhill, to be honest. I should have packed in there and then. Some people say I did. Football's a roller coaster ride, it really is. You know, the lows are, you know, are horrible. You know, when you're growing up, you may have, you know, get released from teams and you get sold, you get dropped. You know, all these emotions that you have to endure throughout your whole career. So when those, you know, those moments in the sun arrive, you know, you've got to enjoy it. You have to, and um, you know, and there's no better place really to celebrate a win than on the pitch at Wembley with your teammates, your family in the stand, um, all together. The joy of everybody because how the club's kind of structured with fans working in the club, you know, doing the kit, doing the tickets, doing the this, doing the food, everything is less. So actually seeing the joy on their faces when you know when we brought home the cup, it was that's probably the, like a real standout moment because it brought so much joy to them. When we went up to get the cup, obviously Matty went up first, not, not just as the goal scorer, but as the captain and lifted the cup and then he passed it down the line. And I was just, I was at the end, I was the last player to go up. I, I don't know why, but I just, I wanted to savour my moment. I wanted to savour everyone lifting the cup and I wanted to see everyone lifting the cup and see the, the joy on their faces and that. And then when it got to me, I just wanted to, I just wanted to do that and I've got a great picture and I'm just going like that and you can just see it's like, done it, you know, done it.